Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Soil Carbon for Your Farm Business. Carbon Accounting, brought to you as part of the Central West Local Land Services ADAPT project. This project is supported through funding from the Australian Government's National Land Care Program. Today, we welcome Dr. Stephen Wiedemann, the Principal Scientist at Integrity Ag and Environment, based in Toowoomba. Steve has also brought along Jim Simon, Managing, Managing Director of McMichael and, and Associates, who has recently undertaken a carbon baselining project with Integrity Ag. Before we get into the webinar, let me introduce myself and run through some housekeeping. I'm Rowan Leach, the Regional Ag Landcare Facilitator with Central West Local Land Services, and thank you for joining us today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Assisting me today is Nerilee Brennan, Team Leader of Ag Services in Central West Local Land Services. If you need help with anything throughout the webinar, please contact Nerilee, whose phone number is on the bottom of the screen. If at any stage you cannot see the presentation, please let us know and we will try to rectify any problems. On the right hand of your screen, you will see this control panel, which allows you to actively participate in today's webinar. You can use the orange arrow button to collapse and expand this control panel during the presentation. In the handouts tab, you'll see a PDF copy of today's slideshow for you to download and view later. All participants are currently muted and this webinar will be recorded today and made available in coming days. Feel free to submit a written question or comment at any time, as there'll be question time at the end of today's presentation. Before I hand over to Steve, we just have a quick poll for you to fill out. This will help our presenter to know a little bit more about our audience and to see what sort of businesses have joined us today. So just bear with me while I launch the poll. So hopefully that's come up. Can you, can you see that, Steve? Yep, so we're getting some responses in now. Obviously you've got uh, cattle, sheep, cropping, mixed farming, or other as your main enterprise of, uh, of you or your clients. So those are just coming in. Um, if we get any in the other column, if you wouldn't mind just putting that in the, in the chat box, that'd be really helpful, just of interest. We will just leave that poll open for another 10 seconds. We're just getting some, getting some more coming in. Five seconds more. Three, two, one. Thank you for that. Uh, I'll just share those results. And no surprises there, in the Central West, 40% of our audience is a mixed farming, 30% cattle, 20% sheep. So thank you for that. Hopefully that uh, is a bit of information for you, Steve and Jim. Uh, so now, uh, I'd like to introduce our first presenter for today. Dr. Steve Wiedemann is an agricultural system scientist with a focus on livestock and plant production, with particular expertise in resource management, sustainability and environmental regulation. He has extensive knowledge and experience in carbon accounting and measuring business carbon output, both in a research and practical industry capacity. He is an expert advisor to the International Wool and Textiles Organisation, the Red Australian Red Meat Industry, the Australian Pork Industry and the Federal Department of the Environment and energy. He is passionate about, about seeing agriculture embrace the challenges facing it and would like to develop better, stronger, more beneficial practices for production and for the environment. Welcome to today's webinar, Steve. Excellent. Thanks very much, Ryan. I really appreciate the, uh, the chance to present and uh, great to um, have everyone on board. I'm just going to pull up uh, really quickly my presentation. Uh, Rowan, perhaps you can let me know when that 
does appear and, and uh, we'll get onto it. Um, yeah, look, thanks also for that in introduction. It all sounds uh, very highfalutin, but uh, I also happen to be a fifth generation farmer and I grew up in Imperial, so a little bit uh, further north from where you are. And we, we still run a sheep and cattle operation up there, a couple of thousand acres. Um, but uh, increasingly these days, I've just leased out the property actually because I can't, can't keep up with all the work that's going on in this carbon area. Um, I figure this is a productive way that I can contribute to industry. Uh, so uh, in, in addition to that, there, there's a little photo there of uh, a few uh, feeder cattle that we brought in after the drought. Um, but in terms of our, our company, as Rowan mentioned, we're based up in Toowoomba. Um, we, we work at, you know, entirely in this field of agriculture and environment, and it's an expanding area with a lot of different aspects. Um, there's, there's elements of environmental regulation, particularly on the intensive livestock side, not so much on the grazing side, which is, is good, and the cropping side, um, that, that's a good thing. Um, but increasingly, consumers, customers, uh, they want to know that uh, the food and the fibre that they buy is um, backed up with uh, you know, good environmental credentials, and uh, carbon is, is a big, big area of that. Um, and that's not, uh, you don't need too much insight perhaps to, to realise that. You just need to pick up uh, the paper or, or, um, or, or any uh, sort of reading on that topic. Um, but on that front, what, why particularly talk about carbon? Uh, for those who are in the, the grazing sector, MLA has developed a, a really proactive stance here, and, and not just MLA, actually, it's really backed by. The red meat industry and, and the peak bodies in that um, whole area spent a couple of years working through how um, how the livestock sector should position itself, uh, and they came up with this program, uh, carbon neutral by 2030, as an aspiration to uh, to drive change. Uh, the NFF also uh, supports an aspiration towards carbon carbon neutrality. And uh, further to that, and this is just a, an example, really, uh, JBS, you, you might have seen some of your recent um, announcements with goals in that area. So, and, and, and you could go on, uh, you know, for a long time on examples around that. But um, we've got these, you know, these drivers, these, uh, these leaders in the area um, identifying this as an aspiration to, to move towards. Um, and now is the big process of trying to understand what it means and, uh, and how you can make change to it. So in, in, in terms of today's um, meeting, we, we can't walk away as, as, as all experts on the topic necessarily, but hopefully I can give you an introduction to it um, and uh, some of the key levers and key things that, uh, that you'll hear a lot more about and, and do on your farm. I know you've talked uh, in the first couple of meetings uh, a lot about soil carbon. So my purpose today is to actually round that discussion out in, in the farm context uh, and talk about where emissions uh, arise and um, what, you know, what can be done about it um, at, in a broad level. And hopefully, as uh, Rowan mentioned, there'll be time for some questions. So uh, by all means, questions and comments, um, fire them through and we'll have a good discussion towards the end. Um, just give a little bit of consideration here for the for the livestock side of the, of the uh, the producers listening in. Um, this is perhaps not the most uh, hope filled uh, slide uh, that I could put up, but I want to just acknowledge that it is quite a challenge. Like you could say, well, why why has the red meat industry sort of made a, a big big deal out of this? Partly because it's a risk um, it is a fact, um, and this is the sort of you know, existing knowledge that's available and it's pretty well worldwide on uh, how red meat compares to other meat um, species. And, and then if you were to add in sort of vegetarian food sources, they'd be lower on the scale than chicken. Um, so high emissions intensity for the product. And this has gained uh, attention really over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and brought red meat right into the, the middle of the discussion um, on its role with climate change. Now, 
everybody on the line today be you know is a livestock producer would be acutely aware that um, there's a lot more to the story than that. This is a single a single metric, um, and and just one point to acknowledge with this blue line here. What that is is um, shows how much human edible protein, basically grain, is required in um, in each of these production systems to produce a kilogram of uh, of meat. And what you can see, unsurprisingly, is is chicken and pork. They rely pretty well entirely on grain, around about four and a half kilograms of grain protein to produce a kilogram of, of meat and uh, and lamb and beef much less. And of course that can go down to zero. Um, ruminants have a, you know, a wonderful role in turning grass into a high quality uh, human um, food product and fibre for that matter too on the sheep side. Um, and that role can't be taken away. But Whichever way you look at it, society is extremely interested in uh, the role in carbon and the uh, the sort of headline numbers are, are a challenge for red meat. So I'm going to just touch on today um, the sort of process that we've been working through, trying to make this a bit more simple and, and, and graspable. Um, and I'm just going to really move very quickly through these steps today, um, really just to give you an overview. Uh, but start with understanding emissions, second, baselining, benchmarking and setting targets, three, reducing emissions, four, offsetting emissions or storing carbon, and five, collective actions. So these are steps that you can put into place, place on, on a property to, to begin that carbon journey and to begin engaging um, with this whole area. So first with understanding greenhouse gases and the, the, the point to make here Again, particularly on the livestock side, is that the the story for livestock is just completely different to the rest of the economy. Um, the figure on the on the left, the pie chart, shows um, in the global economy, carbon dioxide is the big story um, contributing to warming. Um, you see methane contributing 16%. But if you look at a sheep or a beef system, then more like 85% of the effect is driven by methane, and a small amount. Um, from nitrous oxide and actually the smallest contribution from carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide in that case being diesel, petrol, electricity, um, purchased inputs, etc. So it really it's not the same. Nothing that we deal with is um, is all that similar really to the rest of the economy. Um, and it's got a lot to do with the role of methane for livestock. And I'll talk about nitrous oxide for cropping as well. Both of those two gases have a much higher warming effect than carbon dioxide. And this is what filters down to us from the from the uh, international sort of scientists. Um, and uh, methane there at 28 times the effect of carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide at 265 uh, times the effect of, of uh, carbon dioxide. Now there's there's debate around that, particularly on the role of methane. Um, but at the same time, when um, you know, these are the, uh, the sort of systems that, that sort of get fed down to us that we need to deal with. So if we then look at, you know, a an operation, be it sheep or cattle, they're quite similar or mixed as well. You've got livestock, you've got, you know, purchased inputs and processes, feed, perhaps fertiliser, perhaps um, livestock transport, etc. And if, if we look at where the major contributions to greenhouse gas come from, they actually come from the herd and the flock itself. That's uh, the enteric methane. So this is the amount of methane that's burped up from uh, sheep and cattle, and then some nitrous oxide that comes from manure. You end up with a smaller contribution from all these services, five to sort of 15 and up to maybe 20% we've seen at the, the upper end. But rounding out the story, and, and, and sorry, even before I go on, most of the assessment, most of the when you talk about a carbon footprint or something, this is what they've assessed, and and they haven't necessarily uh, thoroughly assessed the other side of the ledger. And that other side is two big two big elements. One being uh, trees. Now that's whether you've planted them or whether they've naturally regenerated. Um, and uh, soils, you know, in this instance, under a productive pasture um, or, or a crop for that matter. 
and, and so it's a bit of a, a question and a, not as much knowledge around on you know whether that offset is you know negligible or right up to a hundred percent and whether farms are, are, are carbon neutral or not um, and that's a big exploratory area at the moment we've been running workshops all over Australia on this topic and there may even be the odd person on the line who's attended um, and what we have seen is there's the odd farm and I'll show some examples later um, that are carbon neutral um, there's some farms that really don't have much contribution at all from soil or vegetation and then there's a good proportion in that sort of uh, you know probably 5 to 25 30 percent offset range so pretty 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 significant and um, as you've spent a lot of time for those who've tuned into the previous workshops uh, di diving into the soil carbon that's that's probably um, the least understood and uh, uh, area of them all and, and offers a heap of opportunity. So uh, just, just talking now about uh, baselining and, and benchmarking, what you might find if you start looking into this. Um, these are numbers that we've tracked for the Australian beef industry since 1980, um, most recently updated in 2015. And there's been a gradual decline in what we call the emissions intensity of beef. So the emissions per kilogram of live weight um, a general trending down. A lot of that's because birds have become slightly more efficient, uh, better weaning rates, so you've got fewer unproductive animals generating methane and not generating much meat. Um, faster growth rates in young cattle uh, so that they're getting to market at the same or heavier weights really, um, but they're the same age or perhaps even younger over time. And that's uh, reducing the amount of emissions per kilogram of meat. You see sort of a general trend there, a little bit higher in Queensland, um, in the middle in, in uh, New South Wales and, and Victoria uh, tends to be on the lower end um, of that, but really driven by, um, yeah, those big levers when you're talking about a herd or a flock, being how many unproductive animals are there running around generating methane and not generating much, uh, much meat or wool. Um, that's one thing and um, managing that. And the other thing is uh, getting that turn off um, to market as early as possible. Um, if you're looking at the sheep story, uh, sheep meat, the impacts are quite a bit lower than they are for beef in general. We're talking more in the range of six kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent up to maybe eight, um, depending on the, um, the flock base. Uh, part of the reason why it's lower than and beef is there's usually two products there's wool as well and uh, the other part of the equation is generally a little bit more productive so you know more more meat turn off um, relative to emissions um, high fecundity etc uh, on the wool side for those who, who are uh, focused on that this is for merino uh, type uh, flocks um, just to give you a ballpark, the emissions tend to range in that 25 to 30 kilograms of greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram of greasy wool. Now this is a, you know, an ongoing challenge and we're going to hear a lot more about it in the wool supply chain too because our markets for wool, of course, are international. Um, most of it in Europe and China and the like, a um, little bit into the USA and particularly markets like Europe are quite sensitive to this. and. Uh, it's, it's uh, inevitable we're going to hear more about um, the wool, uh, the impact of, of wool and greenhouse gas emissions right through that wool supply chain. In fact, we did some recent work looking at uh, wool and garments into the EU and uh, about half of the emissions in the whole supply chain are contributed by the, by the farm. Uh, so um, despite all the, all the processing and, and even garment use by the consumer, um, the farms are a really big part of the equation. Now talking grain uh, for a moment, uh, the story is really very different for grain. Uh, the, the emissions are driven, if you're going to group them, um, mainly by, by fertiliser um, and there's two halves to the fertiliser story. One is producing the fertiliser um, in, in you know the, the factories and wherever that happens to be produced, Australia or overseas, um, and that's contributing you know broadly 
a third of the impacts um, from production of fertilizer and then broadly a third or a little bit less than a third of um, the impacts coming from uh, emissions from that fertilizer after you apply it to the field um, and nitrous oxide I mentioned earlier is a really potent greenhouse gas um, and that alone is sort of contributing 25 percent so I guess a a quarter of the emission profile you can see from this pie chart here. Um, diesel, you might think immediately about diesel, but um, you know, contributing more in that sort of 13% uh, to the emission profile. And uh, the sort of last 10-ish percent is a bit of a, a grab bag of, uh, of other inputs, so your, your herbicides and, and, uh, and what have you. So yeah, really quite a different profile, but it does zero you in a bit on um, uh, fertilizer efficiency, um, nitrogen efficiency become you know, a really big part of the, the game. And if you're looking for some benchmarks, what you might expect, uh, this table here um, from Aaron Simmons, um, it gives you the idea of emissions. This is per tonne, kilograms of emissions per tonne. So, um, wheat you know from a couple of hundred kilograms up to fraction under 600 kilograms canola a bit high um, sorghum in that 300 range um, etc and you can you can see the numbers flow through there but the main thing you can see is you know those emissions per ton are dramatically less than the livestock side of the equation so we do end up gravitating a bit to livestock when we're talking about mixed crops because that's where the the big the big emission comes from on a mixed uh, farm is more so from that livestock side. I mentioned uh, methane being a big part of the story and uh, getting a lot of print, uh, attention, a lot of press. Um, and uh, there are a lot of different ways you can look at reducing methane. Um, and this is a figure that we put together a few years ago just to really summarise all those different uh, different options. But the big ones are these feed additives that we're starting to hear a lot more about. Um, the algae, the, the, the red asparagopsis it's called, and 3NOP are two feed additives um, that are gaining a lot of attention. Uh, they're not quite market ready, but they are pretty exciting because they almost entirely knock out uh, methane. Um, there's also grazing management and um, livestock management over there on the other side. Um, there'll be more talk about breeding um, in, in the future as, as well. So there are lots of opportunities, but there's a lot of research in this, really going right back to the 1960s. And uh, that research, when it first kicked off, had nothing to do with greenhouse gas, by the way. It, it was all about um, production efficiency. Um, methane, of course, has got a lot of energy left in it. It's the same stuff as natural gas. Um, so every time an animal's losing methane, it's losing energy that it could be growing or producing wool. Um, it's broadly, you know, six and a half percent of gross energy intake. And when it rolls through the grazing uh, system, that might be 10 to 17% of metabolizable energy. So um, always the holy grail has been that if you can address methane, it should deliver a, a major productivity lift. Um, and that's certainly you know, a big, big hope in this is that it's not straight out competitive with production, that we might uh, actually get more productive livestock as well as lower emissions livestock. Um, those sort of leading feed additives, um, red asparagopsis, I mentioned 3 and OP. Um, the timelines are getting closer, but they're more in the order of one to five years away from commercial um, reality. You can't go down to, um, to elders and buy those products off the shelf. You can't get them in a block just yet. Um, so it's still a bit of a watch this space, um, but the one to five years ones on the optimistic end of the scale, five years might be closer to the mark um, before we'll have really good products. But the good thing to know is that there, there are some good things on the horizon 
that will um, help address this uh, even you know, between now and 2030. Another one that can be done sort of right away is leveraging what I was talking about there before on uh, flock and herd production efficiency. So um, you can generate less emissions by having more productive animals, but potentially fewer of them. Um, so that's, you know, things that have been become business as usual for many people on, on the line. Um, but it's good to know that that also contributes to a more efficient flock and lower emissions as well, where you can uh, have fewer, fewer uh, dry animals yeah. that scanning or, or um, pregnancy testing and, and, uh, and selling those culls off farm um, and uh, obviously uh, increasing the growth rate of young stock so that they reach market sooner. On the, uh, on the cropping side, I mentioned before that this nitrous oxide is the main greenhouse gas emission. So focus on nitrous, uh, nitrogen use efficiency um, and there'll be a lot more work going to that, um, that uh, you know, split, split applications of, of nitrogen, um, trying to match crop and fertiliser requirements as closely as possible um, is, is the order of the day. There has been some work looking at uh, legumes uh, in that mix uh, and there are opportunities there, but uh, there's, there's it swings and roundabouts a little bit too. So you get emissions from the legume crop and, uh, and the, uh, the biological requirement obviously to fix the nitrogen um, does depress yield with legume crops. Um, you've got nit nit nitrogen uh, nitrification inhibitors, so we'll see plenty of work I think in all this space too of really better fertilisers, better technology uh, to help reduce those emissions. So just quickly to, to make a, a note on, one thing we're going to hear a lot more about as this whole market space evolves is carbon neutral supply chains. So whether it's red meat or grain, or wool or whatever, um, and marketing around that and also carbon markets, by which I mean selling carbon for a profit. So that, that carbon market size, you know, there's some definition around that. There's obviously an Australian market, it's been there for a decade now, um, and there's been a, a huge amount of uh, investment on behalf of the government, billions of dollars in that, and uh, many on the line will be familiar with that process. Um, vegetation's been a big, big part of that in, in the central west, in the further in the western districts. Uh, and now there's a great deal of interest uh, in soil carbon, and I know some of your previous um, discussions have been on that topic. That's the carbon market, and really what you're gearing up there is uh, whether it's reducing emissions or storing carbon. The, the key thing is you're trading it for profit. It's a new product coming out of your system. One thing to note for that you know, in that whole area is if you do sell those carbon credits, you, uh, you're selling them so that somebody else can benefit from them. Uh, you can't also claim that same emission reduction or that same carbon, carbon storage to say that you've got a, a carbon neutral product. Um, and so as the, the whole market evolves in this space, what I reckon is that we'll see more uh, supply chains that want to buy both uh, your agricultural produce and your carbon credits to go along with them um, because they are trying to carry that through the market as uh, a carbon neutral product. So then uh, in, in this discussion, you're putting it all together, you get uh, You've got a vegetation management aspect, a soil management aspect, and this livestock and crop management aspect. And it's really the putting of all those pieces together that um, helps you work towards carbon neutrality and really rounds out the whole story on a, uh, the carbon account for a farm. Now, the, uh, there's a real catch-22 in this whole area. And, and I get, every time I, I speak about it, um, I get you know, lots of questions around 
what is included and what isn't properly accounted. Um, and there is a, you know, there's, you can have a hundred line items on a, on a carbon account for a farm and you could spend uh, literally uh, a decade <laughs> trying to, to, uh, to measure them really well, even on one single farm. Uh, but the, the, the space is evolving and, and, and a lot where it's at at the moment is focus on the main, the main things, the main levers. And those main levers tend to be those purchased inputs, those livestock emissions, uh, vegetation, uh, which is often uh, a positive, so some carbon sequestration there and uh, carbon sequestration under soil. So what I wanted to do was just pull up and give you a couple of examples of farms uh, that have achieved carbon neutrality and just comment very quickly on what they've done to achieve that. And these two figures, uh, this was work done by Natalie Doran Brown out of Uni of Melbourne, um, Tallahini's property around Yass, a so sheep, sheep property, and um, Jigsaw Farms is, is uh, sort of southwest Victoria, both, both are reasonably well known, um, particularly Jigsaw Farms. Um, and these are the, the carbon uh, balances, if you like, of those farms over, uh, over since they were settled, since 1870, you see the scale goes right back to settlement. Um, the top lines in blue represent the change in carbon stored on those farms. And they initially dropped dramatically as um, the natural vegetation was cleared on those farms and, uh, and then continued to decline in the case of uh, Tallahini. And that was uh, mainly a, an ongoing slow decline in soil carbon on that property. Then on both of those properties, major changes were um, instituted, um, one in 1982 and the other one in 2010 to start storing a lot of carbon. And they stored it both in vegetation, that's in the green line there, um, they planted trees in effect, and uh, also in the red line, which was soil carbon. Um, in the case of Tallahini, that had been declining for a number of years, and over a period of about uh, 30 years, there was a soil carbon increase, and likewise at Jigsaw Farms, as they introduced better grazing management um, practices and return more carbon to the soil, maintain better ground cover, um, better healthier pastures, rotational grazing practices, all that, um, you know, really what's seen as, as, as sound grazing management um, also goes along with uh, increasing soil carbon. It doesn't happen really, really fast. You see there actually soil carbon change occurring over almost 30 year time period at, at Tallahini. Um, before it's stabilised again. And that's also a, an important point is that uh, carbon will often move from uh, a, a steady state point um, now and you'll institute some practice change and it'll move to a new steady state point some point in the future at a, at a higher level. But it won't necessarily keep going up forever. Uh, There's another farm that, that we had at, um, a, did a good bit of work on um, up in the New England, um, and it happens to be on a, a flight path that I take out of um, Armidale every now and again, and you can see it pretty clearly from the airplane window. Um, they've done a lot of work here uh, on, on tree planting in particular, and they've picked up some gains in soil carbon, and it's achieved for them around about a 50% offset in their livestock emissions. Um, but they, they, it's worth noting that you can really see the work they've done. They've done block plantings, they've got some agroforestry in there with some pine, um, they've planted out gully lines and they've done some sort of contour plantings uh, that you can see in the image um, on the bottom left and right in those paddocks there. Now they've got tree lines and, and the whole bit. Um, but it usually does take uh, some effort to, to bring about that sort of outcome. So those give you some, you know, some, some examples that where research scientists have gone out and poured over some farms. Um, and I've talked here about, you know, some principles and emissions, but we thought it might be helpful to, uh, to also um, get some insight from uh, someone who's been looking at this from the practical side on, on the farm management side and um, 
what uh, lessons they've learned. So I'd like to introduce uh, Jim Simon um, and uh, Rowan introduced him earlier on as well. And uh, Jim's just going to share a little bit about what they've learned as a, as a, as a company and, and, and what they uh, uh, are starting to look at in this area. So I'll, uh, I'll hand over to you, Jim, if that's all right. Yeah, th thanks, Steve. Um, McMichael Associates, we, we run um, quite a large number of properties through uh, Eastern Australia uh, for private investors, uh, both local and overseas. Um, so we have about 30 properties under management and um, we've been interested in this space for a number of years because we've slowly seen the whole carbon thing gradually develop and now it's accelerating and I think it's really important that we within our client base, with our managers and our owners, we, just, we have an understanding. So we chased up Steve to, um, to guide us through some um, on-farm workshops and, and collection of data on those farms. Um, five of those properties were based around the um, Southern Tablelands of New South Wales, around the Cowra, Yass, Burrawa area. And then we put uh, one outlier uh, down in southwest Victoria, which is a, a completely different type of operation in terms of rainfall and stocking density. Um, and I suppose what we were trying to do is to get our head around just a very broad overview of, of what our carbon footprint is, what does it all mean. Um, so we went through, we've got very good farm records on all our properties, so it was quite easy to collate the information that was required in terms of livestock numbers, selling programs, uh, input records. Um, and whilst we had been coming out of drought on some properties, we just fine tuned our numbers to more to reflect what would we, we would normally be running in a, in a normal season. Um, because, you know, we, after the last couple of years, our property stocking rates down south are probably 10 to 15, maybe 20% lower. Um, so we wanted to reflect a more normal type um, season. Um, I suppose some of the pleasing things we found, and I suppose it, it wasn't rocket science, but it sort of confirmed some of our gut feeling is that generally some of those properties had, um, you know, quite large areas of native timber on them. Um, so in terms of a, a carbon offset, I think, you know, those properties actually came out really well. And I think one place in particular up the Snowy Mountains, I think I'll just look at the data here, we had a, you know, an emissions offset of 185%. So, you know, we, in terms of being carbon neutral, we've actually got plenty of carbon. Um, whereas we went down to the property in Southwest Victoria, which was a, a highly developed uh, piece of, country, 2,000 hectares in um, in very good rainfall country, running about 18 DSC to the hectare, and not much waste land. We probably planted mm, probably 60 to 80 hectares of trees over the last 10 or 15 years, more for shelter belts, and that only had an emission offset of 9%. Um, so that, that in itself is saying, you know, those native areas of, of timber or areas that you can um, you know, fence out that are sort of waste country um, are, are really beneficial to actually doing that process if you're looking at, you know, long term benefits for biodiversity if you've um, perhaps um, potential carbon credits um, and also capital value. I think wherever we plant trees um, and shut areas off, they, they do increase capital value of land. The interesting thing was that on the property down south, and some very broad brush information is that if we took 20% of that property out of production um, to you know try and become more carbon neutral, that's going to wipe approximately $250,000 a year off our bottom line. So that investment is quite significant, and I think that was one of the things we were we were trying to get our head around is. If we have to go towards carbon neutrality, what do we have to give up from a production and a dollars and cents point of view? You know, putting aside the, um, you know, the, the environmental aspects and and being good good corporate citizens, we've also got to look at the bottom line, and that and that figure in itself was quite daunting on that particular property, whereas on the others it, it wasn't. And 
I think some of the things that was, was really positive about what we found out is that some of the proven management practices that have been out there for many years, I think um, anecdotally have shown that we can increase our soil carbon um, and our biodiversity while still increasing our production. And I think there was some um, good data that came out of one property, which is a property we bought for a client about eight or nine years ago. Uh, up in the cow area. It had been not particularly well run by the previous owners. So we just went through our normal practices of um, it's a it's a prime lamb operation um, running about five or six thousand crossbred ewes. Um, and we just went through our normal practices of you know doing up our pastures to perennial based pastures. Um, you know fertilizing them but not going over the top. Uh, um, addressing our uh, soil acidity by applying lime. Um, we've got a good, what I call more of a flexible grazing system. Uh, we've got um, sheep confinement areas as well. And it was just interesting on that, um, I, I suppose, you know, anecdotal, well, not so much anecdotal, but the soil test data that we had, which basically was our normal soil test, not to five, almost 10 centimetres, actually showed that in those paddocks where we had adopted that program, which, we, which I would call best practice, we'd actually taken our soil carbon from a low level of about 1.6% um, up to about 2.4. So just by doing what, what we deem as, as, as best practice with genetics and all those types of things, it, it shows that we can make those investments in the things that we can continue to do. And it does have that uh, added benefit that we know that we can increase soil carbon. So yeah, I suppose the thing we've really been looking at is saying, what do we have to actually give up if we have to go towards neutrality? Um, I think this whole area of soil carbon is just developing so fast that we've sort of said, okay, we want to get a better understanding of it. Just sit back and let the thing develop. You know, we're not out there to sell excess soil carbon at this stage. I think we want to see how that whole market develops. We don't know where government's still going to sit in this. You know, we could have a change of government and the whole landscape could change tomorrow. And there's a lot of, um, I think, corporate investment beginning to flow into Australia, um, you know, about in investing in properties and carbon and those types of things. But I'm also a bit nervous that I've been around long enough to see that, you know, we've had a bit of a debacle, you know, 20 years ago with the management investment schemes um, throughout, you know, Western Australia and Western Victoria. I'm a bit nervous we might see that happen again in this carbon space. And I think, you know, I, I think we've got to be very careful how we um, look at this whole area. And I think from a from a grower's perspective, I think it's small steps at a time. And that's why we've been working with Steve, because, you know, we've got some very credible science behind this. And it's sort of taking out the noise of all the, you know, yeah, there's a lot of noise in that space at the moment. Um, yes, Steve, are you? Want to add anything more to that? Uh, I think it's really good, Jim, and, and good the, the practical perspective, and and yeah, there's a dollars and cents component to that too, and and um, we have to be aware of, and yeah, I kind of see this evolving that um, a lot of people ask, you know, well, planting trees or that that they, they might grow for thirty odd years, and then what happens after that? Um, or soil carbon, like we've seen, generally changes over a period of 20 or 30 years and reaches a new stable. Um, but they're things that we can do now, and they may have, you know, they, they may work in other areas, and then the technology might kick in, or we expect the technology to kick in to address that methane problem, you know, whether that's seven years or 10 years or whatever. So um, it's good to be thinking, okay, we can do some things now, um, hopefully with a line. With, with practice and we don't need to go necessarily completely overboard um, and that will fit in then with that that, that sort of uh, technology uptake and you know, there, there's, uh, there's a tremendous amount of investment lining up to, to, to try and bring that about so yeah no, it's great great to hear that the practicals and, and, and the think the thought process I think going on with you guys. Yeah, and I and I think one of the things that um, you know, doing through that workshop process of coming out, you know, uh, different strategies on each farm, um, 
you know, in terms of doing tree plantings, maybe fencing off more native vegetation areas, looking at where we've still got opportunities to improve pastures and, and, and you know, looking at genetics, all those types of things, how we continue to evolve those. I, you know, I think that's really important. And I think, you know, the next stage is, you know, we are doing different things on these properties and they're at different stages of development. And I think we're keen to continue to look at how we can do some continually on-farm monitoring that we can, you know, compare and feedback through the client base. Because, you know, some properties we're using compost. Um, you know, there, there seems to be some benefit of that, but we're able to, to make sure that we can get the right regime to, to measure what we're doing on those farms. And I think that's, really important that we continue to not just say well we've done this project with Steve and we're going to stop I think the important thing now is to say well let, let's continue to set up some monitoring on farm so that you know when opportunities come up we can actually demonstrate that yes we are moving in the right direction and I think that's you know this is just the first step I think that's that's really good Jim yeah, I wonder if we uh, if we pause and uh, we want to make some time for some some questions or comments or insights, um, and then I'll uh, I'll just make some closing comments. Is is that the best way, Rowan? Do you think? Has he got some yeah, questions coming? That's, that's probably that's probably really good. Yeah. Yeah, Rowan, are you happy for me to add in a few questions at this point for Stephen and for Jim? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's a great idea. Um, I might just uh, slip in first, narrowly, just with one. That's my prerogative as uh, as the organizer, <laughs> I think. Um, and it's music to my ears to hear Jim say that that he's been building soil carbon with best management practice, and and um, yeah, that's just really exciting for all those producers out there that feel like they're doing the right thing. Um, Steve or Jim, have you got any comments for? The people that have been doing this this good work and they've um what we've sort of learned in some of the previous webinars is that um you can't you can't sort of go back and and count work that you've done 20 or 30 years ago what's what's your comments on on those that have that have been doing good stuff for a few years and and they will want to sort of take it take advantage of this stuff now yeah no good good question rowan and and um it's, it's an acknowledged area of frustration for a lot of people who've been doing a great thing. Um, in the carbon market in particular, they're crediting change. So, um, and that's change from a baseline which has to be today. So it has to be new change. Um, and because of that, you know, carbon changing um, from one steady state to a new steady state over a period of time, if you're at the start of that joint journey, you might have a lot of opportunity for change. If you're halfway through that journey, you might not have as much opportunity for change. And that is, is, is a fact. Um, it, the important thing is working out where you are in the change and, and that's the, the benchmarking or baseline activity. Um, you can get a bit of insight on that from uh, sort of agronomic soil tests, but um, as I'm sure you heard a great deal of, um, the soil in the soil side, there's a lot around um, soil testing. Uh, one good thing is that the federal government seems to have just announced a heap of money for it um, to, to uh, try to pin that. So understanding, getting that baseline in work um, helps you know where your starting point is and can give insights into how much further change you can get. Um, that's one side of it. Another side of it is there are other programs other than carbon popping up and backed by you know, yeah, biodiversity and um, and natural capital, which are better geared at rewarding the good practice you're already doing, um, and that's that's important. So some people also find it frustrating on the tree side that a native forest that's mature um, may not be sequestering a great deal more carbon. You need new trees, you need growing trees, and so if you've got a mature area of, um, of bushland, it actually may not be sequestering a heap more carbon. And that can be quite frustrating too, but it may be delivering other things, biodiversity. And uh, there's gonna be lots of work in that space to um, open up opportunities to, to uh, you know, to demonstrate and even capitalise, monetise the value of that too. So 
So I hope, hope that helps. Yeah, that's a great answer. Thanks, Steve. That probably answers a, a few of the questions that the audience had. Um, I'll hand over to Nerily. Nerily, uh, what what more uh, some some questions that have come in from the audience? Yeah, thanks, Rowan. There's been some good questions come in. We've got quite a few to look through. I'll start at the top and work my way down. Uh, Stephen, I think this one's for you. In wool, how uh, how do the emissions compare to synthetics? Yeah, good good question. Generally, dramatically higher. Um, so. Just like I showed the results or, or, or some figures beginning with me, it's a similar challenge for wool. Um, it's, it's usually not quite the highest emission intensity fibre that exists, but it's it's right up there. Um, and that's a big challenge in this space. Yeah, great. Thank you very much for that. Um, the next question that's come in, where did where would someone go to get the carbon cost for farm infrastructure like fencing materials things like that um the person who's asked the question says they they can find easily for fuel inputs and things like that but what about the on-farm infrastructure yeah, yeah good good question um the short answer is it's not very easy to get <laughs> um we have databases and there are databases that provide some of that information. They're generally not publicly available because not everyone really wants to know. Um, what, so that's the short answer. To add a bit more context to it, farm infrastructure is generally a tiny contribution. So even in some of the published work, early published work picked it up, found that it was less than 1% contribution. Um, and so, you know, it's just cause to, to not even take it into account. And you've got to think through the, the, the process. You know, I prefer that only build one one fence in a lifestyle a lifetime. So uh, my hope is that I'll only have to come back, or my son will have to come back, not me. So the input is divided by a very long life period, um, and that makes the contribution pretty small. Yeah, great. Thanks for that, Seven. The next question that has come in for us is one of the arguments for HGPs in cattle is the increased production per beast. Um, but how does that go? Does it have a significant um, impact in terms of emissions reduction? Uh, good. Yeah, good question. Um, it's generally a sort of five to ten percenter. Um, there has been a bit of work done on it in, in America. Um, there's a production efficiency sort of dividend, growth rate dividend. Um, so yeah, look, carbon and, and some of those principles are pretty agnostic to the approach you use. So yeah, you can use those, those type of approaches and they can be effective. Right. Oh, now we're getting through these questions well, but the next one that's come up is, is there a, a rough rule of thumb for how many hectares you'd need to plant down to trees? to sort of offset a cow and calf unit? Okay, yeah, good question. Um, so cow and calf unit uh, emissions should be in the order of two tonnes per year. Um, that's off going off the top of my head, which is always a bit risky. Um, <laughs> uh, and the tree species has a really big part of that story. So to give you an example, um, some of those mixed environmental plantings where you're trying to get a different canopy cover and there's some shrubs and there's some trees and some fast growing trees, some slow growing, the kind of land care mix that you, you get. Um, sequestration rates are often between, you know, one tonne per hectare per year and four, five, six tonnes per hectare per year. Rainfall has another big big role in that, uh, right? So at the low end, you're talking almost a couple of hectares per, per cow unit. At the, at the top end, um, it, it's uh, you know a quarter of that. And then there's another piece of the puzzle is that fast growing trees, um, and really you can, you can tell this, you can see, you know, and whether that's, again, whether it's an introduced or, or a, one of the fast growing eucalypts can reduce that quite a bit too, because they'll, they'll um, you know, they just sequester a lot of carbon. So yeah, I'll give you another rule of thumb that might help when you're thinking about trees. Um, 
for every ton of dry wood, so let's imagine firewood, you go and fill out, fill up the ute with firewood. If you get a ton of firewood, that's equivalent to about two tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Uh, so that's, you know, again, you need around about a ton of dry wood um, to give you uh, your two tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. So I hope those, those help. Yeah, great, thank you. And would it be, uh, what sort of numbers would be talking for sheep? Somebody's just piped up with that question as well. Yeah, we use a rule of thumb of sort of 250 kilograms for DSE. Um, and that captures both the livestock emissions and usual inputs from diesel and fertilizer, et cetera. So yeah, that, that'll give you a, a, a rough uh, idea. Um, and you can use the same sort of numbers for, for tree planting. Um, and, and the same, you know, sort of considerations with with how much you can uh, you can uh, store store in timber. Great, thank you. Right. Now, Jim, there's a question that's come in for you, um, and somebody is asking, what's the the monitoring that you're talking about setting up on your farms? I think the main one is is getting uh, better at our soil testing. We do we do a lot of our normal you know, naught to 10 um, tests, soil tests um, every year across our properties as we're improving pastures. But I think it's, it's um, I think Steve has sort of suggested that we probably need to be doing uh, uh, deeper soil tests um, and probably doing more soil tests regularly, particularly across paddocks that we're, um, we're improving um, to, to baseline them before we start. And then over a period of, of five or seven years, continue to monitor them. Just um, you know, not, just not from a normal nutrient point of view, but also looking at our our carbon and and are we actually increasing it? And and the anecdotal evidence to date on some of those farms is that we have. So I think that that part of it's very very beneficial. Um, and I also think those monitoring of those biodiversity areas. I think as as we also um, you know plant unproductive land out, um, eroded areas out that, uh, you know, we, we are monitoring those. And I, and I think in most of the programs that we're doing with LLS funded projects, um, with tree planting, you know, there's always, we, we've got to report to those guidelines, you know, for 10 years. So I think those two things will become more important as time goes on. Great, thank you. And I think we'll sneak in one more question, Rowan, and then um, I'll hand back over to you. Uh, but a question's come in, Stephen, is it worth soil testing the natural pasture areas, mountainous terrain, so not farmed or fertilised? Yeah, look, I think the, the question is, what um, change are you gonna bring into that system that might prompt soil carbon sequestration? and it is, you know, there's a lot to dig into in that. Um, you can test it for your own interest, and that that's that's great. But if you're talking about an investment and baselining, especially when it comes to soil carbon methods, is generally an expensive exercise. You would pick the areas where you think you're going to get change. Um, so if you're going to be able to introduce practice change into those areas, um, then then they'd be the ones you focus on. You don't necessarily have to focus on a whole property and maybe the areas where you've got the best chance of uh, seeing an improvement. Great, thanks Steve. Um, thanks for those answers. I think probably just just before we, um, or, you, or you finish off, where, where do you see this what, what, what do you see happening in this space in the next sort of four or five years? Is this testing going to be get cheaper? Is it is it going to be more widespread? Do you think, or is it something um, sort of consigned to the to the fringe? Yeah, no, good, really good question. Uh, I'm sure most people will have taken note of the budget announcements. Oh, the federal government's getting right behind this now. They've invested or earmarked a couple of hundred million dollars behind um, soil carbon um, to begin a, a major program, I think a 20 year program really in uh, in that area. So that'll, in, I think what we'll see is 
better testing mechanisms that are cheaper, um, probably modelling rather than testing everything. Um, as you can gather from what I'm presenting today, we don't go and measure the, the methane from livestock. That, that's not possible on farm, so you, you model it um, and that cuts through and makes it less, uh, less expensive. Um, we do need to see progress in that area and, and we definitely will. That's sort of on the government agenda. Um, better testing as well, for that matter, as, as well. So that'll be on the soil side. Um, and I think we'll see, you know, these feed additives and, and uh, new products um, coming on the market. We'll see better, you know, clearer pathways for monetizing that. Um, and uh, yeah, it'll, I, with my view, it'll ramp up pretty dramatically. The, the kind of drivers in this area can't be ignored. They're not actually even government. They're, they're mainly uh, customer and consumer. Um, I'd say it's the, the, the biggest drivers, uh, business ones now. Um, so I, I think the, uh, the the ball's well and truly rolling, and it's now about keeping a good watching brief on uh, the technologies as they become available, and doing what you can do now, and uh, and starting to track it. That's an exciting note to to finish on. If you have um, if you have finished your presentation, Steve, I might um, take back over. Is that finished? Uh, yeah, look, happy to wrap it up there. I only had one more, one more slide, but um, you can wrap it up there. Great. Well, I'll uh, I'll just thank you again for um, for your wonderful presentation today, uh, and Jim as well for your uh, your practical experience. That was really good to to see the uh, your your research and and your um, your your scientific approach Steve and, and Jim your practical seeing it on the ground it's been really good. Uh, so just before we go I'll uh, give a quick plug to, for some upcoming LLS events. Uh, we have got some some winter pasture workshops coming up in Yagara and at Tullamore and we also have some sheep pregnancy scanning field days coming up at, at Forbes at the end of May. Uh, once again, I'd just like to thank Steve and Jim for their time and presentations. Uh, if you'd like any more information, please get in contact with me. Uh, and that's that's about it for today's presentation. So thanks all for your, your attention and um, yeah, we'll see you next time. Thanks everybody. Thanks. Bye. See you later. Bye.